everybody, Daniel Bach here from jumpscience.com. This is Speed Science 5. We're talking about sprinting research. Now the research involves both acceleration and top speed, so we're going to talk about both things. Okay? So let's talk about acceleration. Let's say we have two hypothetical athletes here, athlete A and athlete B. Okay? Uh, these models are showing the moment when the front foot hits the ground. Okay? So athlete A is a skilled accelerator. So athlete A is going to hit triple extension pushing off the ground. When the back foot leaves the ground, athlete A is going to keep low heel recovery. This foot is going to sweep forward here and then drive back, creating backwards velocity relative to the sprinter. Um, and that's going to balance out the forward velocity relative to the ground. And the foot is going to strike the ground then with little to no velocity relative to the ground. It's not going to go forwards and create braking force, it's going to end up going straight down into the ground and minimize braking force, okay? That strike is also going to be uh, pretty close to directly underneath the hip. Alright, this is skilled acceleration. Athlete B, on the other hand, is not a skilled accelerator. Athlete B uh, may or may not hit triple extension, but regardless, when this back foot leaves the ground, it's going to cycle up more, okay? It's going to take a path more up here underneath the hip and then end up coming more straight down. There may or may not be any backwards foot velocity. If there is, it's not going to be enough. So the foot is uh, not going to balance out the forward velocity of the sprinter. It's also not going to get underneath the hip. So the foot is going to be uh, out in front of the hip a little bit and it's going to have a little bit of forward velocity going into the ground. Okay, so this is going to create braking force. So we have skilled and unskilled acceleration. So let's say we're doing research on these two athletes. Uh, we're measuring their acceleration uh, with probably a short sprint time and then also measuring the force that they're putting into the ground. Uh, if we look at athlete A, because there is no braking force, uh, when athlete A is pushing into the ground, the force is all going to be uh, down and back or the force on the ground is going to be up and forward, right? It's going to start more up, right, at impact and then it'll get more horizontal uh, during the course of that contact on the ground, okay? Uh, if we look at athlete B, athlete B has braking force, so the force coming back from the ground is actually going to start out somewhat backwards, okay? and then that will progress to getting more forwards throughout that ground contact. So we have athlete A who in order to accelerate forward simply pushes forward repeatedly. All right, That's the effective way to accelerate. Uh, athlete B on the other hand pushes backwards a little bit and then pushes forward repeatedly. Okay, That is the less effective way to accelerate. However, uh, as usual there is give and take here. Meaning you lose one thing you gain another. Okay, so athlete B may be accelerating with less effective technique, but what is athlete B going to gain from that braking force? Uh, well, realize that this initial push on this front leg is against the momentum of the sprinter. Okay, so that momentum now is opposing the muscle contraction on this leg. We have opposing force to that muscle contraction, that's going to mean we get more muscle tension. All right, if you don't understand that, check out my series on muscle tension. Um, but so we're going to get more muscle tension on this front leg because we have an eccentric contraction going on. Okay? Now the other thing that comes along with more braking force is more ground contact time. With more ground contact time, you can build up more neural drive and you can get more muscle tension that way. Okay, so athlete B is going to be able to build up more muscle tension in this leg that's on the ground and may actually end up pushing more force into the ground than athlete A. So most likely, athlete A is going to be a trained sprinter, right? That's why athlete A is skillful in acceleration because sprinting is the sport, okay? Um, and athlete A is probably going to accelerate better than athlete B. Athlete B is probably a team sport athlete, um, not as skilled in sprinting, okay? So when you have two different classes of athletes. The athlete A, the more skillful accelerator, is going to accelerate better than athlete B, even though athlete B is pushing more force into the ground. Okay, so if you have two groups of these athletes, 
and you're looking at correlations, you're going to find that it is the skill that tends to produce better acceleration rather than increased force. Okay? So that can lead people to conclude that acceleration is all about technique. But let's say athlete A is a skilled sprinter, but maybe at the high school level. And athlete B, uh, maybe not as skilled, but maybe this is an NFL football player we're talking about. Uh, athlete B very well may accelerate faster than athlete A, even though athlete B is less skilled. Okay? So it all depends on what people you look at. Right? The correlations that you're going to find between technique and force and uh, your rate of acceleration depend on what athletes you look at. Okay? Now, the truth is, skill does make you a more effective accelerator, okay? but so does force. Okay? If athlete A improves force production, athlete A is going to get faster. If athlete B improves force production, athlete B is going to get faster. Okay? So acceleration is not all about technique, it's not all about force. Both things are factors, but if you do research, you may find all types of different correlations, you may find all different conclusions from the research, and it can all be very confusing. Okay, let's talk about top speed now. Again, we have athlete A and athlete B. Uh, the two legs now do not represent two legs, but they represent one leg at two different times. Okay. This leg being the moment of impact with the ground, and this leg being uh, just before the backwards velocity of the foot starts. Okay? So in a more skilled sprinter, we're going to tend to see a higher knee, right? More front side mechanics. We're going to see a more dramatic snap back. We're going to get more backwards velocity of the foot uh, to match the backwards velocity of the ground. Uh, so the foot is going to get closer to zero velocity before it hits the ground. It's also going to be closer to directly underneath the hip, right? Very similar to acceleration, uh, just accomplished in a different way. And then athlete B, less front side, a lower knee, uh, and then we get less of this backwards foot velocity. Uh, the foot is going to be further out in front of the hip, and it's going to have more forward velocity as it goes into the ground, okay? So athlete B is going to have more braking force. So again, we have more skilled and less skilled. Now, just like acceleration, the more skilled top speed sprinting is going to come along with uh, shorter ground contact time. And in this case, that's also going to require uh, a higher vertical force production relative to body weight. Okay? So, again, if we're putting together a research study and we have a group of these people, probably trained sprinters, right? And a group of these people, probably more like team sport athletes. Uh, things should make sense here. We're going to get uh, higher force production, less ground contact time on the people who are faster. But what if we're comparing between all trained sprinters? Okay, we have some who are uh, like this and they have basically ideal mechanics and we have some who are not quite there. Uh, the ones who are not quite there, the ones who are a little bit in this direction are going to have uh, longer ground contact time they're going to have lower force relative to their body weight, and they're actually going to have higher horizontal forces because they break and then they have to propel forward each time, so they have more propulsive force. Okay, uh, but those sprinters could actually be faster. Now, how does that happen? How does lower force production and less skillful mechanics produce higher speed? Uh, the primary way would be with height. Again, there's a lot of factors here. If you're only looking at a couple of them, uh, the correlations or the direct comparisons between two people can be very misleading. So, just like acceleration, when you research top speed, it all depends on who you look at. Right? I mean, if you're comparing uh, trained sprinters and soccer players, things are probably going to make sense. Uh, but if you start comparing soccer players to each other or trained sprinters to each other, uh, the correlations in the data may be misleading or confusing. Okay? So, if you look at the research done on sprinting, uh, you see a variety of different physics measures, right? You've got your vertical and horizontal forces and impulses, you've got uh, contact time and flight time, you have stride rate and stride length, you have acceleration measures, you have top speed measures, you've got uh, treadmills, you have force plates, you have overspeed training and resisted sprinting, 
Um, so there's all these different methods, all these different measures, and then they're done on a variety of different people. Okay, And so it creates this big data pool, and then they just look for correlations between anything and everything. Okay, Now, to be honest, a lot of the sprinting research sucks. Like it's overcomplicated and it, you end up just learning nothing. Okay. Truth is you've got a complex object in the human body and a pretty dynamic movement in sprinting and uh, people are going to use their different bodies and achieve sprinting in different ways and that's going to produce uh, very different physics outputs. Okay. So you could have two people who run the same speed with very different physics measures. Or we could have similar physics measures at very different speeds, okay? Uh, when you take data across a population, it just turns into a crapshoot, okay? It, it gives you nothing. You don't learn anything. Instead of relying on correlations, what you want to do is understand your subject matter, okay? If you understand the physics of sprinting, you can make sense of all this data, all right? I am yet to find any research that confuses me or that uh, disagrees with the simple physics I've been putting in these videos. So for example, uh, somebody who was arguing with me once pointed out this study where they had a stronger correlation between horizontal force and top speed than between vertical force and top speed. Okay. Now because I understand the physics of sprinting, I can understand how that would happen and I'm not going to be misled into thinking that horizontal force determines top speed. Okay. Uh, because the physics say otherwise. Correlations can be wrong. Uh, another example. This is a, a direct comparison between two people. So um, apparently Usain Bolt has uh, lower vertical force relative to his body weight and a longer ground contact time than uh, Tyson Gay. And yet Usain Bolt has a higher top speed. Okay, so a direct comparison between those two seems to say that vertical force and short ground contact time uh, make you slower, right? Of course, that's false according to physics. Um, why is that possible? Well, Usain Bolt's taller, and that's the big factor there. Um, but truth is, it's just a complicated subject. There's a lot of factors. If you're only going to measure two, you may or may not find the correct correlation. Now, a better way to understand Usain Bolt, rather than comparing him to Tyson Gay, would be uh, measure things on Bolt when he was running 21s, okay, in the 200 and then measure things when he's running a 19 in the 200. Now you see what changed that allowed him to run that faster time. That would be valuable information. Okay, so maybe a good research study would be to take a group of athletes and uh, put them through a training program over the course of months or years and see how it influences them, see how the measurements on them change, and see how their speed changes as you go. Okay, that would be really good research. Now, who gets to do research like that? Not researchers, not scientists, coaches. Coaches get to do that all the time, okay? And that's why coaches usually understand things before researchers do. So, while I've been putting out these speed science videos, I've been called out, uh, had my credibility questioned because I'm just a coach and I'm not a scientist. Well, first of all, I'm the president of Jump Science University, thank you very much. Second of all, uh, coaching is a constant science experiment, okay? Uh, it may not be published research, there may not be statistical analysis on the data, but coaching is a constant science experiment. And uh, staying with one athlete through a training program and seeing how it affects them is the best way to learn. Experience is the best way to learn, not research.